Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Don with Stout Tanks and Kettles. I'm here with Doug Beatty, who's uh, our technical services manager, uh, starting a talk for the uh, CBP Spring Virtual Conference here. Uh, we're going to talk about starting a brewery on a startup budget and uh, some of the ways that you might be able to save and how they impact you in your uh, your business planning for your brewery. So um, I'm a former brewer of about 10 years. I've been uh, with Stout now for about four uh, helping design breweries uh, and helping to uh, uh, match people's business plans to the equipment that they need. So uh, this has been a fun opportunity here to talk for CBP. And uh, I'm going to let Doug give himself a quick uh, intro here as well. Hey, uh, so I've been a, was a brewer for 25 years, opened a lot of breweries over those years, including uh, one for myself a few years back. So I uh, have a pretty good perspective on this uh, topic today, for sure. Excellent. All right. Uh, I'm going to pull up a quick uh, PowerPoint here. We're going to go through it, and then we'll have plenty of time at the end here for uh, any questions that you might have. Uh, let me just see here one second. Bear with me. All right. So our topic today is opening a brewery on a startup budget. Um, and uh, I like this, this caption, you've dreamt about it for years. Let's help you make it happen. Uh, it, the biggest roadblock to opening your brewery is obviously the resources at hand and uh, having the money to get it started. And now more than ever, uh, folks are looking for ways to curtail the initial cost of opening the brewery and some ways that you can save some money in the opening of your brewery uh, that would be uh, non-detrimental so that you, you know, you have to realize what you're going to have uh, impacting your brewery as far as uh, the pros and the cons of uh, saving some money up front. But I think that's what we're going to kind of go over here real quick in this uh, PowerPoint, uh, starting with some of the initial areas where we would first start to save some money um and once again the whole time we'll be talking about the pros and the cons uh so that you can make some wise decisions for yourself but um, typically in the two to five barrel range uh people are starting up their hey don and yeah that uh powerpoint's not showing powerpoint's not showing okay but you can hear me but the powerpoint's not showing yep i got a okay. black screen all right. You are not showing. What about now? No. No. Okay. Well, technical problems here. Tech help is here uh, to save the day, hopefully. Uh, Don, what we're seeing, you're sharing your screen. We're seeing StreamYard right now. Just open up the PowerPoint window. That mm -hmm. should solve the problem. Uh, the PowerPoint window is open. Then I'm going to remove it from the stream and reshare it and just share your entire screen. Let's okay. try that again. Like I told you off camera, I appreciate you both being here today. Always appreciate the support you all give CPP. And like I said as well, love the shirts. Who doesn't like those awesome <laughs> shirts? Good luck. Everybody wants one. And Don, it appears we are still seeing the same shared StreamYard tab. Are you able to okay. potentially click your PowerPoint window? Yeah, give me one moment. Um, I'm going to see if I can get that up and running here inside like Chrome or something. Um, uh, if you could just take over for a few minutes there, Doug, and I'm going to work on that real quick. Well, do you want to, uh, maybe we'll start kind of going through some of the things that we were talking about um, without the uh, visuals. You think that's all right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, initially we're going to start by hitting our, our first area, which is going to be kind of platform. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and how we can make some savings there. Yeah. So we, so we were talking, one of the things that we want to talk about is, 
uh, things that things that you can save on things that are important, uh, things that you can do without. Maybe you could skip and wait till later. Uh, things that, uh, you know, would be nice to have, but, you know, it's all about sticking to the budget because it's, when you're doing a startup, it's very easy to get way over the budget. Uh, you know, you want to stick to your business plan, stick to your budget as best you can. Uh, one of those things um, on our list, I guess there's a lot of things, is the full stainless steel platform. You know, everybody sees those uh, shiny platforms and says, you know, that's what I want, especially if you're looking at stout tanks, equipment, all very shiny, all, you know, good showpiece kind of stuff. And really the the platform, it kind of depends if you're in a brew pub and uh, you're in a fishbowl, everybody can see everything. Certainly the shiny platform is a little bit more important than if you're, everything's hidden out of sight, like a production brewery or maybe uh, just not that fishbowl kind of setting in a brew pub. Um, the full stainless platform, it is nice, but it's much more expensive than the uh, than the galvanized powder coated platform. Um, a fraction Are of the seeing, Okay, so we're seeing this now. You got it now? Yeah, there yeah, you go. I believe so. All right, good. Okay, good perfect. So, um, yeah, once again, I apologize for that, everyone. Um, just had to open it in a different way. But, um, yeah, when we're looking at opening a brewery on a startup budget, you know, that that uh, initial area uh, can be uh, constrictive and can keep you from meeting your dreams. And that's what we, we want to try and overcome that obstacle. So uh, a lot of people are utilizing their savings in order to make this happen, 401ks, um, you know, angel investors, uh, some people are putting up their houses as collateral, you know, so we don't want to mess it up. We want to make sure that you have a solid business plan and that you're taking into account the um, unique situation of your brewery, because every brewery is just a little bit different than the other. And let's see here if I can make that happen here. Okay. So working with the budget, um, will it impact my brewery? You know, we're talking about um, long-term and short-term impact. So uh, in many cases, if you spend less at the beginning, uh, the long-term effect is obviously that you pay more. But um, sometimes it's just a matter of getting the initial concept going, uh, proof of concept and, and, and showing that it's going to work and engaging the environment of your customers in order to uh, really prove that it can get going. And then a lot of times it's easier to find the money afterwards. Um, like Doug had said, the uh, stainless steel platform we're talking about um, is an aesthetically pleasing. It's, it's a great way to have your brewery look. Uh, a lot of people want to have a showcase, um, but this is a spot where I go to first uh, because a lot of times people in the three and a half to five barrel range, they are uh, not in need of a full platform like this. Uh, a lot of times there are some third party uh, places that you can go on the internet and do a build your own platform. And they would probably save you about, um, well, I, I, as far as uh, cost, I would say they're probably about a fifth of the cost of a full, beautiful stainless platform. So uh, it does give you the ability to get that extra height to use your system. Uh, and if it does show signs of having any sort of like rusting, it's just a matter of redoing the powder coat on it. So one thing that I would say about the platforms is I see people saying, uh, particularly on a smaller system, like let's say a, a three or a five barrel system, I say, I want to save some money and I'm just going to rig something up that I can stand on to stir the mash. Uh, there's a safety factor involved there as well. So some sort of yeah. a platform is better than standing on something makeshift. I, I, I've seen that as well, Doug. And sometimes you see people where they say, well, I'll just use a step ladder and that just scares the <laughs> yeah. heck out of me. Yeah. Uh, the fact dangerous. is if you go, if you go falling over into something that's boiling at 212, uh, yeah, you're not going to be very happy and you're probably going to get hurt. Um, one, one of the things that's not explicitly, um, uh, said here in this slide is that the um, one side we have kind of a, a freestanding platform and that's for individual vessels to be brought together uh, and connected with hosing. Uh, and, and that is um, a large portion of the systems that we can get out 
much faster than than the custom say hard pipe as you could see on that right hand side uh, i think that's uh, from nothing's left brewery uh, it looks like they had a uh, a nice uh, hard pipe set up there um there is a cost difference there is about a uh, 10 to twelve thousand dollar difference between going with a freestanding system versus a hard pipe system now the benefits of a hard pipe system is you have pre-established pathways uh easy to train folks on and uh also just not having a lot of hosing that you could potentially trip over or you have to be coiling so so our next spot is the glycol chiller and the groundwater temperature is going to have a huge impact on that. Um, those people who have breweries that are in the northern part of the United States where your groundwater stays really nice and cold uh, are going to be able to benefit from that because you don't need to have as much of a, a cooling system. Um, you're not even going to be um, looking to uh, run any sort of a glycol assist typically unless you are uh, an exclusive lager brewery. And um, I think this uh, uh, pro chiller setup over here was from Ridgeview Farms. Doug recently went out there and uh, had a great time showing them, uh, you know, some of the brewing techniques there because they were uh, particularly mainly a winery. Um, but uh, getting out there and being able to engage is kind of a great thing. Doug, do you want to tell us about your experience over there? Yeah, that's a great spot. Uh, I mean, uh, you talk about a cool place to visit. Uh, I'm sure in the summertime when the, when the grapes are growing and, uh, you know, they're adding on to the winery, they're going to have some great events this summer. Uh, I'm going to try to get back there myself, actually. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, I, I think that um, when we're talking about, um, you know, that groundwater has a huge effect on the initial draw of BTUs. And if you're looking at, um, say, 60 degree water, your, your best ability to be able to knock out is going to be 68 there's typically about eight degrees of separation there. Um, and when we consider the glycol assist as part of the glycol chiller, it, it increases the size dramatically. So if you are fortunate enough to be in the Northern United States or somewhere where maybe you just have water that is not gonna increase in temperature and it's gonna stay nice and cool, you don't need to have that glycol assist and therefore you can have a smaller chiller, keep it on a small, much smaller budget. So. Um, some of the ways around that, uh, to achieve pitch temperatures, uh, I, I like to call it the poor man's cold liquor tank. Uh, we utilize a brand new IBC tote. Uh, and, uh, in the case of what you see there on, on the slide, we do have stainless, uh, with dimple jacketing that you can utilize, uh, as kind of a CLT, but you do need to have a glycol system to run it. Uh, the other option would be the plastic IBC tote that is pallet jackable that can be put into your cooler, uh, say the day before, it's gonna hold about 300 gallons or more, uh, in which case you have 10 barrels of uh, cold, cold water that you can use for your knockouts. So um, typically you would hook up to that with your cart pump and go through your heat exchanger at whatever gallons per minute that you need to in order to establish your, your uh, chilling. And then uh, pros versus cons. Um, I, I would say on the um, uh, on the cold man, the, the cold liquor tank with the IBC tote, I, I think there's not really too many cons to it. I think you just have to have the space in your cooler. And when you're not using it the rest of the year, when it's nice and cold, you can store it easily because it has no weight if there's no water in there. Um, I, I think the, the, the con would be um, if you're trying to do a lot of lager brewing, you probably want to have either that glycol assist or um, a full on cold liquor tank set up where you can continue to do multiple batches. Is there anything I'm missing there, Doug? Well, you know, one thing I see, I see a lot of people oversizing their uh, glycol chillers, uh, which can really add a lot to a startup cost. You know, you have to kind of be realistic if, if you if you only have so much space and you're not going to be adding a lot of tanks, um, you know, you, you really want to think carefully about what size glycol chiller you want. Yeah. And that can add up very quick, like you said. So Absolutely. So um, 
the heat exchangers, the work chiller, whatever you, you happen to be, the terminology you're using here, we're talking about, um, that is the initial BTU draw over a very short period of time. Um, so matching it up properly, uh, having those eight degrees of separation. Uh, there's times where I talk to people and that, that is <clears throat> not an issue for them because they're um, maybe making a beer style where warmer knockouts are not a big deal. Uh, maybe they're making some sours or whatnot. Um, so it really comes down to uh, the styles that you're doing. Um, another area that it does have an impact on, though, is the, uh, the extra plumbing that's involved when you're running a glycol assist versus a, a just a standard single stage. So um, I think in the, the, the long term, um, just matching it to, to the types of beers that you're going to be doing. And the um, I like to have a, a heat exchanger that's just a little bit bigger. So it's you know, have less clogging issues. So uh, typically I'll look into the larger frame size um, versus some of the smaller frame sizes that are out there. So. One thing you can do too is even if you you know spend a little bit extra to get the two stage, you don't necessarily have to uh, plumb that in to to start. Like let's say it's cold weather when you're uh, starting up, uh, you know maybe just you save a little bit of money and uh, not spend that extra money on the glycol piping until uh, later when you do need it and you have some money coming in. Yeah, it's a great point. And and another thing with sizing a, a chiller is a lot of times uh, when you have a, uh, a vendor that you're working with that can um, perhaps later on give you the, uh, the secondary plates uh, to do the glycol, as long as it's the same frame size, then uh, that's also something you can always add on at a later date. All right. Now we're on to the mash tun design. And uh, this is pretty common that uh, no matter what size, everybody wants rakes and plow because they're just like, oh, I have to move grain. But um, sometimes the cost of rakes and plow can really um, uh, affect your startup. And when you're talking about a few hundred pounds, I think it's more important to have a good grain out than necessarily have the rakes and plow. Um, I, I've brewed on both 20 barrel and a 10 hectoliter system. Um, on the 10 hectoliter system, we did not have rakes and plow, and uh, it made just a great, just as great a beer as the other. Um, it was all about just the grain out. Uh, I think a little bit of stirring and a little bit of uh, exercise doesn't hurt any of us. Um, <laughs> but when we're talking about it, it all depends on the brewer too. If the brewer's uh, uh, starting off very young and and uh, in good shape, great. If you're a seasoned brewer and you've just been there and done that uh, and you truly insist on it, then it does cost some money in order to have that. But um, the, those two vessels, uh, I would say the flat top design is just about half of the cost of a rakes and plow. So it uh, can add to the cost very quickly. And then when, once you have that motor on top, then you need to have controls. And then you know, are those controls going to have to be UL listed? If, you, if you're an initial brewery and you're going to go through inspections, you're going to want the UL listing in order to get through inspections very easily. If you're an existing brewery that's been around for a long time, maybe you can get away with non-UL listed, but uh, just knowing that if you were ever inspected that you may have to uh, uh, upgrade at that point or, um, uh you know, have to pay for that uh, particular aspect of it. I, I feel that the UL listing is important and ensures that your your um, electronics are going to be uh, in, built to a high standard and you're not going to burn your building down or anything like that. So I think it's very important to, to consider that, um, that uh, ability to sleep well at night. Uh, is definitely a good thing. So the rakes, and the then, rakes and plows are are nice. They're definitely uh, save you a lot of wear and tear on your body. But if you're in a seven barrel or smaller, it's really not that hard stirring the mash. Uh, I mean, if you're mm -hmm. older, obviously, you know it's it. Uh, like I said, it takes a toll on your body, um, but it adds a lot of expense. So it's something to really think about. How badly do you really need that? Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, you know, on any of our hot side vessels, it, we talk about insulation versus non-insulation. So um, a mash tun, you typically want to hold its temperature pretty well 
a lot of people really want insulated, but if you're on a budget at the beginning, there's enough thermal mass there for say single infusion mesh uh, where you're not going to be losing that much temperature over duration of time. Uh, a lot of times your enzyme conversions for your grain uh, are happening so fast. I mean, they can happen as quick as 20 minutes, um, you know, 20 minutes of rest, 20 minutes of Orloff and go. Um, typically in the past, I've seen that uh, on a commercial level because the grains are just so well modified these days. Um, but th that considered, um, that could be 800 to a thousand dollars on each vessel for your hot side. So on the mash tun, uh, a lot of times if someone has a Herms coil on their hot liquor tank where they can recirculate and either bring up the temperature or hold the temperature, it's not as crucial to have the insulation on the mash tun um, because then you could utilize herms in order to maintain, um, you know, the, the pros and cons of the, uh, uh, um, of the rakes and plow versus flat top are pretty apparent. I mean, Doug just kind of chimed in there. You know, I, I, once again, I've brewed on, on both sizes with and without, I think it's all personal preference and your budget. Um, I don't think in the long term there's any huge loss, uh, other than, um, perhaps maybe down the road when you upgrade to another system. Um, so, um, yeah. And then we kind of have the same thing for the brew kettle and the hot liquor tank. You have these flat top versus dome top designs. Um, the benefits of the, uh, of the flat top and the dome top, there's really not a huge difference. Some people say, oh, well, the dome top's going to give you uh, your steam uh, an easier egress. It's, it's not, not the case. It's, they're both going to work equally as well. Um, there is a lot less cost in not having to make that dome shape. Um, so that can bring down the cost of that vessel dramatically. Um, also for the hot liquor tank, uh, when we talk about uh, the sizing of that, a lot of it is, especially on the electric systems, it's determined by the power and utilities of your building. So when you have a low amperage availability for an electric system, and uh, the main reason I bring that up is for us at Stout, I would say electric probably makes up a good 80% of what we sell. Um, they, it is kind of a clean an easy way to get going. And a lot of people are doing it because you don't have to do the HVAC work that's involved and uh, any sort of specialized plumbing for like steam fitting. Um, but when you have this low amperage option, we'll, you know, typically oversize the mash ton or oversize the hot liquor tank, sorry, and put a timer on it so that you're ready to go for multiple batches first thing in the morning. Uh, if you do have good utilities, you can run a high amperage option and you can run it concurrently at the same time as you're boiling in your kettle. Um, insulated versus non-insulated on these two vessels, I find to be much more of a sticking point because of safety. Um, I like having insulated brew kettles um, and hot liquor tanks because if you happen to bump into these vessels and as they get larger, it, the chances are quite high that you will possibly bump into them. It gives you just a few seconds of safety, um, you know, so that you're not getting scalded right off the bat. Um, if you left your hand on it, you would still get scalded, but uh, <laughs> sometimes even that few seconds is worth a lot so that you don't get hurt. So um, I don't really see a ton of um, pros or cons here. I think that both of the vessels are gonna be very capable. Um, I, I do feel that insulation is important for these vessels for safety, but Doug, do you want to yep. kind of chime in? Yeah, absolutely. On the insulation, as far as the dome top, again, this is kind of a, a showpiece kind of a thing. If your brewery is not on view to everyone, there's really no reason to go with that dome top. I mean, it does look nice for sure, but I guess you got to decide if it's worth that extra cost or not for you. Yeah. Excellent. Um, this is kind of reiterating a lot of what we said as we've been going along here that, uh, heat source options, you know, your building is going to dictate this incredibly. Um, you know, I still feel the the cleanest and easiest setup is electric. 
Um, for the most part, you have an electrician do about an hour and a half to two hours worth of work. Uh, a lot of the remainder of it, you're able to uh, run those cords yourself because you've dictated how long they need to be and we've already pre-wired it. So um, quick and easy, no carbon monoxide to vent out. Um, direct fire comes in at a lower cost, but once you add in that HVAC work, um, they're, they're about a wash um, as far as uh, the cost of the system. The efficiency of the system, electric is definitely way more efficient. Um, but depending on where you are in the U.S., your electric costs could be different than your gas costs. Um, those could always be in flux, and um, each person's geography is going to have a, a big um, impact on that as well. So uh, indirect fire, great option. I love it when I can't do an electric. I love indirect fire. Uh, just because it's not affected by the negative air pressure that direct fire is. It's a much more efficient flame, uh, but the vessels cost more to shape and, and they have a lot more weight uh, because they have a firebox with refractory brick in them. So uh, those vessels uh, do cost a lot more to make. And then steam, the vessels do not cost that much more to make, but uh, adding a boiler to your costs, uh, plus all the pipe work, uh, you are looking at, you know, adding good 40 to 50 grand to your system cost. Easily. Um, so I, I, I tend to recommend steam for uh, larger systems, uh, 15 barrel and above. And the only time for smaller systems would be if somebody has existing infrastructure. Um, I think that uh, the pros and cons to that are, are really just dictated by the building and or your business plan. Um, electric. You know, if you have an electric system and you steal all the power from your building and you have a kitchen and you need to run things, um, that's where you could kind of hamstring yourself. So it's taking in the whole picture of your business plan and thinking it through. And that's where uh, a lot of discussions that I have with customers come into play because uh, we'll discuss that. We'll, we'll say not only just what system and but we're talking about how much beer do we need to make to fulfill the needs of your building or your business plan so yeah the venting uh on the direct fire you're like you said your building plays a lot into that and a lot of people don't think about it up front about the uh the venting uh you know it depends on where you're at maybe you don't have a lot of room to vent out mm -hmm. or or just uh the tiniest bit of space um uh, you know and and we sell a con condensate stack where you have a s turn that allows you to catch any of that uh, residual condensate as it comes down. Um, but the, the one big thing is if you're very short on space, you never want to go straight up from your brew kettle because any of that ducting, uh, that steam is going to condense and you're going to have rusty water coming back down into your brew, into your uh, brew kettle. So um, keeping in mind the space and the constraints is always an important thing. So many wild cards when we're talking about, you know, putting together your brewery and um, so many things to consider. So uh, controls. So, yeah, we, we work with Brumation for our controls. Uh, we have basic controls, advanced controls. Um, I, I say brewer's preference. Um, you know, the, there is a cost difference, obviously, between those, depending on the system type. Uh, could be a few thousand dollars. Um, and it really depends on what type of brewery you are. I was always, uh, using, you know, manual switches and, uh, and gauges and, uh, just keeping a very detailed log. Whereas the bonuses of having an advanced control system, which, uh, didn't exist when I was, when I was running, uh, my brewery, or if it did, it wasn't in my, my cost, uh, to have is that uh, it keeps track of a certain amount of things for you, temperature trends, um, some recipe parameters, uh, alarms. Uh, having a visual interface is nice. I don't know. There's, there's uh, different schools of thought. I like knowing that I've manually either moved a valve or not. Um, but at the same time, uh, some of the remote capability and being able to check in on the brewery is nice. And I've had it where a lot of people on uh, islands for some reason, usually because maybe they're on in, in, out in Hawaii or maybe they're out in, the, in Bermuda or 
or any of these islands where you have like one or two highways. Um, but it takes you like, you know, 45 minutes to get to the other side uh, or more. Uh, it's nice to be able to check in remotely on that. And a lot of people do that. Um, VFDs versus non VFDs for a long time, variable frequency drives are expensive. They've, they've come down significantly in cost and um, almost everything that I quote has a variable speed drive on it. Um, just because it's, it's so much uh, more precise and uh, it, it wears and tears the, the, the motor so much less. Your pump is going to last so much longer if you have a VSD on there versus just restricting it with a butterfly. Um, I feel like that, that back pressure eventually just affects those seals. Now, granted, seals are something you're going to have to learn to change anyway at a certain point in time. But um, some people, as a cost saver at the very beginning, will, will say, no, I don't need variable speed drives. That is totally an option to go. And that is something that people did for years. Um, I myself like to have that kind of precision on my pump and not beat up on my pump so bad. So, Yeah, I think the VFD is uh, well worth it. One of those things uh, I personally wouldn't skimp on. The, the control panels, that's an easy cost saver there. Um, certainly there's nothing wrong with basic controls. If you, if you want all the bells and whistles, you know, be prepared to pay for it. But the, the VFD is, I think, that's a, a good investment to begin with. Yeah. And there are times where the controls make sense. The advanced controls, maybe you're not brewing and you want to keep tabs on how the brewing is going. That is an important thing. Um, but, yeah, that is a quick space, uh, probably second to the, uh, to, to the platform that I would say uh, as far as uh, looking for cost savings. Um, and then um, what do you have here? We're working with a sensitive budget. So um, considering some of your options, we here at Stout, we utilize some partners uh, for lease to own programs. The nice part about a lease to own program is that the equipment is its own collateral. Um, so you're not necessarily putting your house up for it. Um, they can fund it quickly for, for qualified, uh, uh, qualified individuals. Um, but, uh, it's not a SBA loan or anything like that. So it's a whole different type of funding. Uh, some people love it. Some people don't, but you know, in the, the, the rule of things is sometimes you just need to get started and find a way to get it going. Uh, beer is particularly lucrative, uh, especially, um, when we look at it as, um, being able to withstand re recessions, being able to be pandemic resistant um it is a great industry to be in because it's a simple pleasure that people do spend the money on and um uh, finding the, the right way to do it the other reason for a lease to own program versus traditional funding is maybe you have some capital uh that you want to save towards your build out and um if you're doing that um then um, spacing out the cost of your system over the course of say five years is not a bad idea um, in order to be able to make it happen. So um, next thing is just don't overspend. You know, that's kind of part of my job is to make sure that you're matched up with the right equipment. Uh, I would say a large portion of the time um, I'm talking to people and, you know, they can come to me saying I need a 15 barrel system and really they need a seven. You know, it's just a matter of matching it to the business plan and the business plan is key. It's, it's the, the rules with which you are setting up your engagement with your business and um, uh, super important. You know, no one, no one can really get any money without a business plan these days. It's not, not like it used to be where you could just uh, uh, decide <laughs> I'm going to open a brewery and I'm just going to make it happen. And uh, through sheer will uh, not the case anymore. So um, working with someone you trust uh, you know, and, and doing your homework. These, these are all things that, um, you know, as, as a, a brewery designer, uh, a person that I talk to on the other end of the phone, I, I want to treat their resources and their business plan the same as I would my own. Uh, I want to give honest advice. Um, and I want to, um, make sure that we're, we're not overspending because I want them to succeed because in the, long run that is where someone comes back to you is if you've done them well um 
you know, the other thing about trust is uh, the, the information you get. Maybe somebody might not intentionally be lying to you, but um, know where your advice is coming from. Is it dated? You know, um, the typical uh, r- rule that I've o- always heard from people is, oh, if I could have done it again, I would have just bought bigger. And um, yeah, maybe five, 10 years ago, obviously. Yeah, definitely. Um, everybody's experiencing double digit growth. Now there's 9,000 breweries out there and growing. Um, and there's still plenty of room to be a part of it. It's just having reasonable expectations. Um, are you going to be a regional player? Most likely not, unless you have incredible funding and a killer business plan. Are you going to be a neighborhood location where people can go and drink beer in your four walls and make a good profit? I think that's the best model right now. Um, you know, I think some people will augment that with a little bit of packaging just to, to shield themselves in case of uh, the pandemic or, or anything that happens in, in our economy as we're going along, you know. Doug, do you have anything to add to that? Well, one thing about the budgeting is uh, it's it's going to cost more than you think it's going to cost or more than you budget. And it's going to take longer to start up than you think it's going to take up. It's uh, it's not a quick thing opening a brewery, no matter how quick you want it to be. So you want, you want to take those things into account with your budgeting. It's going to it's going to cost more than you think it's going to cost. So be careful with that startup. Yeah. Yeah. And I would, I would say, um, construction times when somebody gives you construction time, double it. Um, you know, luckily, uh, I think this past year with supply chain has, uh, brought a lot of people, um, uh, into the idea that you have to take it by the reins and, and move with it, uh, versus just hoping it's going to get better. Uh, in the past year, Stout added two more international companies we're working with as far as, uh, logistics so that we can get our products uh, moving back and forth uh, in order to uh, have those systems ready. So uh, in the past six weeks, so over 21 containers in our warehouse. So we are kind of at the height of having our stock ready um, and uh, just trying to plan accordingly to keep those, those lead times down because uh, everybody has a different business plan. Some people can wait. Most people are shooting for summer. Um, and that's, that's always the thing. And as summer gets closer, it gets harder and harder to nail that one down. But, uh, we do our best to get you what you can as quick as we can and, uh, uh, doing with some good advice along the way. So, um, let's see our last slide here is just, uh, checking in on questions, uh, that people might have. Um, you know, we have these stackable tanks here. Uh, this is a, stackable uh, mash tun on top of a hot liquor tank. Uh, this is Heckler Brewing, I believe. And um, it's nice to be able to maximize your footprint. Uh, that's another area where we didn't really talk about it as a direct savings. It's much more of an indirect savings. Um, but when you consider every square foot of your building is a cost to you, um, maximizing on your footprint is huge as well. So. I'm going to close this out and get back with Doug here um, on the screen. We can uh, talk about uh, talk about some questions that folks might have, uh, maybe some experiences that both uh, Doug and I have seen where, you know, without naming any particular places, but maybe things that we've seen that have worked and that haven't worked. Um, you know, obviously uh, utilizing a stepladder uh, as your platform is a bad <laughs> idea, so don't do that. Uh, yeah, you got to take into account uh, safety things. You know, uh, in the early days, uh, a long time ago, when, when Don and I were, were young brewers, you know, uh, people were looking at cramming a brewery in, in, in the smallest space possible and in just not safe, not safe conditions. You know, um, I think people are being a little bit more considerate of the brewer. So situations like that have gotten a little bit better. But you always want to take into account safety, safety factors as far as your spacing yeah. goes. Yeah. I mean, that, that was kind of par for the course for brew pubs for years to, you know, yep. the, the, the customer facing area is what makes the money. Um, yep. So they were going with this model of say one square foot per barrel of production. So if you were a five barrel and you were making 500 barrels a year, 
that you had to fit within 500 square feet, which is a, just a bit tight. Um, uh, I, I think, um, you know, uh, when you want to consider the fact that a workers' comp lawsuit could cost you, um, some space is always important. Uh, Matt, that's why matching the, the system size to the space is important. You yep. want it to be tight enough to uh, be profitable, but you don't want it to be so tight that your brewers are getting injured uh, on a regular basis because they can't move around. Um, so that's definitely important. So I think with the with space constraints too, you want to think about if you want to think long term, you want to think about things that you can uh, change out later. You know that uh, if you're building around a brewery, what's going to be harder to to uh, take out later? You know, you can upsize certain small things, but uh, you know, a, a whole brew house maybe you don't have the room to completely, you know, bring in a double the size kettle or mash tun. Um, what's what's going to be easy to change out later on? That's something to think about yeah. if you upsize. Well, yeah, in, in urban areas, people uh, working with very little space. Uh, one thing that, that I would say is is my advice to anybody who's doing that, like um, there was uh, one brewery that uh, I know of that uh, had to tear open the floor to lower their equipment into the basement uh, and then build the floor back up over it uh, because it was a basement brewery. But then uh, in asking, have you looked at any of your equipment? They're like, no, it's still sitting in crates. And I'm like, all right. Um, you know, that's that's a big bit of faith. We have to. That, that easy to change out of that. later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's, it, and it's not just one brewery. It, you, would, you would wonder because these projects take so much time. And, uh, you know, your initial thought is I'm going to just keep it in a crate just to, to keep it safe. And that's great, fine and dandy. But um that that floor going up is a permanent and it definitely has an impact. So yep. uh, always keeping that in mind uh, is, is key as well, because that could save you a lot of money um, not having to re-rip up in the floor uh, to change something out. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, uh, the brew platform being the first spot to look um, and then your controls and then um uh, you know, and getting into the um, uh, maximizing your ge geographic location. So if you have cold water, uh, you're going to benefit. It's kind of unfortunate that the people that need a cold liquor tank have the such hot temperatures that they're already fighting to begin with. Um, so it's it's a pain that's felt for anybody that's living down in southern United States or even uh, Mexico or whatnot, where you're going to have to spend the extra money. Um, on those systems. So, yeah, if you're in a if you're in a northern state, uh, it's pretty unlikely that you, depending on your situation, that you you really need a cold liquor tank, uh, especially if you're mm -hmm. a brew pub versus a packaging brewery. Um, and another and another thing to think about with the savings is that I think a lot of people it's underappreciated is the the heating method. Uh, you know, yeah, steam's great, but a lot of people don't realize all the expenses that go into a steam system. It's not just that boiler, but getting that piping done is not cheap. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that steam fitting can cost as much or more than the boiler itself. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that's that's more and more common with uh, the, the wages that are involved uh, and, uh, you know, the, the distances that are involved in your building. Your building can, you know, totally uh, have that impact. Um, you know, so when we're, we're talking about, um, um, some of the other things would be, um, that I didn't bring up. Sometimes people are like, well, turnkey, turnkey. I don't want turnkey. I'm going to save so much money. The chances are that if you are saying you want to get rid of turnkey, that you're probably going to need it. Um, because the majority of, of folks that I'm dealing with are startups and, that turnkey presence, as much as you say, oh, I don't want to pay for that, that support is really going to help you get going and it's going to keep you uh, moving along. And it's very important to have that because time is money. Um, you, know, it, you know, if you're thinking about how to plumb this thing through and you're trying to get all the parts together to do that, great. You know, as long as you have it figured out well in advance and you're maybe you're an experienced brewer, but anyone else, I would say 90 
99% of what I sell is turnkey as far as, um, especially when we're talking about control situations, because um, everybody says, well, I can save a lot of money there. Maybe you could save some money, but are you going to save yourself some headaches and save yourself time? Time is really key and time is money. So, You know, another thing that we uh, didn't talk about that's a good savings potential uh, up front is malt mills. Um, you know, you can, if you're really on a tight budget, you can buy pre-milled malt and uh, do without that mill to start. Because yep. uh, not only do you have the cost of that malt mill, but what if you need a separate room for it, depending on your uh, your zoning, uh, your auger? There's a, there's a lot of expenses yeah. that can go along with that. Yeah, and that, that's one that, that I, I kind of kicked myself. That should have been on our, our slide because the fact is that um, uh, you're totally right. You know, these days, pre-milled malt, um, when we are uh, uh, talking to people who buy from maltsters, maltsters are going to have those, you know, four or six roller mills, <laughs> you know, they're <laughs> going to have the, the much nicer mill than, than most people will have. You're going to pay more per pound for your grain and you'll probably have to order your base malt by the pallet load. So, you know, 40 bags at a time or something like that, unless you have a good relationship, maybe they'll do a half pallet or something for special uh, uh, customers or someone local to them. But uh, typically, yeah. It's a great way, um, and I see it more and more, um, to keep the mill out of the uh, out of these brew pubs where you just don't have the space. Yeah, and a lot of, even a lot if of you dust have in the, the, space, in the restaurant the area. Dust, yeah. yeah, the dust that can get into your, you know, into the air and make its way into a tank. That that naturally occurring lactobacillus on there that could really funk up your beer. Um, you know, yep. you don't want that. You don't want to have all of a sudden sour flavored beers and things like that, unless you're controlling it, you know. Um, but yeah, the, the, the fire marshals are, are, depending on your location, can really put you to the ringer on yep. a mill. So when you talk about a mill and you put it on your floor plan, do not call it a mill. Call it a grain <laughs> cracker or a grain crusher. <laughs> Anything but a mill, because the uh, second you say that, the hairs on the back of the neck of yeah. your inspector go up, and they they all of a sudden are in a tizzy because they're thinking of flour mills, um, you know, bakeries. Those that fine particle uh, becomes so much more combustible. Um, that said, if you do have a mill room, it's good to clean on a regular basis. It only takes a thirty second of an inch to be combustible, yeah. um, so. The important part is utilizing uh, explosion proof motors, which we do on, on ours. Uh, we do offer them without that, but you know, I, I, that's kind of like insulation versus non-insulation. If I'm talking from a safety component, those couple extra hundred bucks are probably well worth it. So, yep. um, yeah. All right. Um, I think uh, everybody's circumstance is going to be unique, and that's why it's important to have these talks. We're going to cover the bulk of it in, in these, um, but there's always going to be a given, something that we haven't come across yet before uh, because your unique situation. So, um, you know, if that happens to be the case, uh, getting on the horn, talking to us about your business plan and the equipment you're looking for, uh, giving us the opportunity to quote you, you know, in the end, uh, you're going to decide who you're going to go with and how you're going to go with it. But um, give us a chance. You know, I think if, if you get to work with us, you'll realize uh, that we have your best interests in mind. and uh, You know, we can uh, talk through some of those facets of the business plan with you and get you pointed in the right direction. So. Yep. And if you do have uh, questions after this is done and uh, mm -hmm. we're not live anymore, uh, reach out to us at any time. Yeah. Excellent. Happy to, help. Happy to answer your questions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I just want to say thanks to CBP for having us. Uh, always a wonderful experience to be able to get out in front of all your folk and uh, talk about the, uh, uh, the things we're seeing in the industry and the things that need addressing in the industry and uh, hope to continue to do it many times more. Um, thanks to a Andrew and everyone else there. Yeah, and, thanks, Andrew. Uh, CBP. Yeah, and we're going to uh, get on going with our day here, but uh, 
please feel free to give us a ring. And uh, I hope you have wonderful and safe brews ahead of you. Take care.